Lieutenant Commander Pixel here reporting for duty with another game review. Today, I'll be assessing whether this Star Trek Strategic Operation Simulator game software conforms with Starfleet regulation performance parameters for a TI-994A port of an arcade hit. I've always had a soft spot for Sega by way of their TI connections. They use TI sound and graphics in their debut SG-1000 game console and its computer cousin, the SC-3000, by extension. And that legacy was still to be found in later generations of their game hardware as well. But really, console genealogy aside, it was probably enough for me that there was a big Sega logo on the covers of what seemed to me to be three of the TI-99's most impressive games. It was enough to make me think, on the TI-99, Sega really does what Nintendo don't. As to those games, well, Congo Bongo's isometric platforming is pretty freaking cool. And more than any other game of its era, Buck Rogers Into the Screen Shooter action made me go, Wow, my TI-99 can do this? But it's Star Trek Strategic Operation Simulator, which is the one that makes the biggest dent on the system for me in the long run. And that's despite it's looking like the least unique of the three on the system from where I'm standing. Seriously, you don't need to worry you won't get your TI-99 Star Trek fix without Sega by your side. You could always play TI Trek, or 3D Star Trek, or 99 Trek, or Mike DeFranc Star Trek, or Super Trek, or Starship Concord, or the Star Trek-inspired adventure Strange Odyssey, or the Star Trek-themed Tunnels of Doom adventure, or uh, Star Trek? Well, basically, a game's got to do something special to rise above the pack in a busy landscape of TI-99 Star Trek games. But Star Trek SOS does that for me. So Star Trek SOS, which I'm definitely calling it, because I refuse to say the word Strategic Operation Simulator 30 times in 10 minutes, it's a good game. And it's a good game even on a pretty cluttered landscape of early 80s Star Trek games. But is it a good version of the original? And how does it compare with other versions of the game? Well, on that first question, we can cut to the chase, because what's true of the TI-99 version of Star Trek SOS is true of every single port the game got, and that is that none of them looks much at all like the original, since the original was a vector game. Only one home system of its era had a vector monitor, and hilariously, it wasn't ported to VectorX, though the game prominently features color graphics, so it wouldn't have been a perfect fit regardless, and VectorX got Star Trek the motion picture instead. The upshot here is that each version we did see had to visually reinvent itself pretty much from scratch, so there's a fair amount of variety. Any version of Star Trek SOS has to deal with some pretty demanding expectations if we're looking at the arcade experience. It's got to simultaneously update two completely different perspectives on the field of play, one of them with large objects scaled in real time. Ideally, it should also imitate the arcade version's use of speech synthesis. Well, 99ers are in good shape on the latter count, obviously, and the game does not disappoint there unlike pole position, with its not having speech synthesis on the TI-99 in a game that uses speech synthesis. Anyway, old grudges. Honestly, nobody's in good shape to manage the object scaling in the world of early 80s home computing, a problem that Buck Rogers faces as well from this cohort of games. Though ultimately, there is accurate incremental scaling in the TI-99 version, as you can see here. The effect is small enough that it's not easy to pick up a lot of the time. Given you're close enough to shoot an enemy, then you should be shooting the enemy. You should have already shot it. No time to stop and smell the battle cruisers. But the object scaling is there for when you notice it. When it comes to reviewing early 80s TI-99 games that got ported just sort of everywhere, a question I usually can't help asking is, so how's the ColecoVision version look? Since with the same graphics architecture, the answer's often, well, pretty damn similar. Which is the case for the TI-99 and Coleco versions of Wing War and Tutankham, for example. 
But what differences there are are often interesting, so let's take a look at the ColecoVision version of Star Trek SOS. As far as differences go, something I like here is that the Enterprise is portrayed flying into the sector, as in the arcade version. And we don't get that in the TI-99 version, you just show up in the sector. Also, the Enterprise's shields around it are visible here, present in the arcade version, absent in the TI-99 version. Finally, the explosion graphics are huge and colorful and certainly stick out, but there, I don't know how big a fan of that edition I am. Uh, the gigantic orange and red explosions just seem to clash with everything else about the game's aesthetics to me, which are minimalist and dominated by primary colors due to the game's vector origins. So I really don't know if I like that tile-based eye candy at all, and so I don't think I miss it in the TI version, given it just feels kind of out of place to me. Finally, one big difference is that, of course, there's no voice synth in the ColecoVision version. So there, we definitely have a head start in the TI version as far as living up to the arcade experience. But let's get back to the TI-99 and take a look from the beginning at how this game is structured and what makes its Star Trek gameplay unique on a busy landscape of TI-99 Star Trek games. First off, we don't get the fanciest title theme you've ever heard on the TI-99 here. Excellent title screen otherwise, though. Love the Enterprise graphic. But imagine for a moment if, instead of this, we got Barry Fishman's TI-99 Star Trek theme. Well, this isn't music software, so let's put that aside. On a more positive note, where sound's concerned, we get the same speech synth, Welcome Aboard, and Welcome to the Sector, that we would get in the arcade version. Welcome aboard, Captain. Entering Sector 1.1. So that is very much appreciated. As the game begins, its structure reveals itself pretty straightforwardly, but what makes this game so special comes to light. It starts as the same two-dimensional representation of a space field filled with Klingons that we've seen in TI Trek and in its ilk. But now control is real-time rather than turn-based, and we have a view from the bridge, too. In terms of gameplay, it quickly becomes clear that your main job is attacking red and yellow Klingon battlecruisers. Red Klingons attack you directly, while yellow Klingons attack star bases, which you need to restore your photon torpedoes, shields, and warp energy. Blue antimatter saucers try to attach to you and draw away your warp energy. And a note uh, on how warp works here, it doesn't work the same way as in the arcade version at all. Uh, in the arcade version, warp is basically a brief burst of speed. Here, warp is just a higher speed than impulse. I think mechanically I consider the way it's implemented here less interesting, but I think it's more accurate to the way warp actually works in Star Trek, which is to say it's a constant rate of travel in excess of light speed, rather than any kind of jump or burst. In the end, I'm happy either way, and this is a fine solution. As far as scoring and objectives go, killing a Klingon ship is naturally where you score your points most often, but destroying an antimatter saucer gets you 5,000 points. You also get points for not docking at star bases available to you, maybe a little unintuitively at first, uh, so playing efficiently instead of sucking up the entire sector's supply of photons at every opportunity is rewarded, I guess. Finally, killing your main enemy, Nomad, gives you a whopping 30,000 points. But more on that, the game's choice of Nomad to be the big bad here is a little odd, and it makes me wonder. This character, if you can call it that, is from a fairly poorly regarded second season episode called The Changeling. Nomad, which was an intelligent space probe gone rogue, 
was dangerous, sure, but the Enterprise never did battle with it. And Kirk just talked it into killing itself, so how does it end up here? What I'm inclined to wonder is if Nomad's ending up here is a result of Nomad's character stock being at an all-time high, just as the game was being developed due to Star Trek the motion picture being seen as a retread of Nomad's story. Star Trek II made Khan a star, and, well, Star Trek the motion picture made Nomad a little more of a running joke, I guess? To the point where fans have been known to call the movie Star Trek, where Nomad has gone before. Otherwise, I've got no idea why a mentally ill space probe who's got confused and offed itself from a pretty ridiculous episode whose major events are completely forgotten by the series ends up as the main antagonist in a popular Star Trek arcade game. Weird. Now a word about control. Star Trek SOS can actually be played with a standard joystick, but you might not want to, since control definitely isn't suited to a one-button solution. Aside from turning with left and right, you have four other control actions. Warp, photons, impulse, and phasers. To wedge all those in, the solution is to map impulse to joystick up, phasers to fire, photons to joystick down, and warp to fire plus photons, which is sufficiently confusing that in the case of the 2600 version you're given a joystick overlay, which you can place on top of your joystick to always remember that the Enterprise warps by firing its photons and phasers simultaneously? Anyway, you've got a keyboard on our TI-99, and that is an excellent solution to games requiring more than five inputs, so I strongly recommend going that direction, where S and D will be left and right as usual, and where H, J, K, and L will be warp, phasers, impulse, and photon torpedoes, respectively, nicely placed in a row. So this has been my overview of Star Trek Strategic Operation Simulator for the TI-99-4A, the culmination of the dream of a real-time Star Trek game where you weren't just looking down on a tile-based playfield, but were instead looking outward on space from the bridge of the Enterprise. This is not the most graphically elaborate version of Star Trek SOS out there, but as I say, I think simplicity works for this game's aesthetic, and the presence of voice synth is a major boon. I find its design most logical. <laughs>